is Margaret Brennan. She was born in South Wheeling, graduated with an undergraduate degree in history in 1967, and her master's in public history from WVU. Oh, <laughs> she taught many of uh, the area's youth while a member of the Sisters of St. Joseph working at Wheeling Central High School. Later, she worked in archival administration for the Diocese of Wheeling Charleston and has served as contract historian for Mount Deshaun, the Wheeling Symphony, Wheeling Hospital, Wheeling National Heritage Area Corporation, to name a few. She is a staunch protector of Wheeling's history, as most of you know. For many years, she was president of the Wheeling Area Historical Society, which disbanded in 2010 and helped organize and publish the Upper Ohio Valley Historical Review, which is still published. She is very active in the community, has served on numerous boards and committees, and was the driving force behind the installation of the monument honoring Wheeling's Irish, or the area's Irish immigrants, located at Heritage Port, which you see on the signs. Uh, I also want to say that this program owes Margaret Brennan a lot. A lot of the things we do, those ideas originate with her, and we appreciate all that she does for us. And she's here today to tell you about the Wheeling Irish. Well, welcome, Margaret Brennan. I don't know where he found out all that stuff <laughs> that we probably made up. Um, it's so good to be with you here today. Um, as we come together to focus on the history of the Irish in Wheeling. Now I have to give a disclaimer. This is not a complete history of the Irish in Wheeling. This is a work in progress. For example, the Irish were very uh, active in the labor unions, and we really haven't done that research yet. We had a bunch of Irish gangs running around the city. And I'd love to know more about the Holly, Holly Town Gang. I think they were South Wheeling. You know, who were these people? What were they up to? So there are some things we don't know. But I say to you this Tuesday, Kate Vila a 100,000 welcomes. This is so exciting to be together. We're having this talk, of course, because yesterday was March 17, St. Patrick's Day, the traditional holiday memorializing St. Patrick's death around the year 460. And doing the research for this talk, I found out that we um, don't know as much as we know. For example, they're not even sure what year St. Patrick died, so I just chose one. <laughs> Isn't it amazing that 1,554 years later, we're still talking about this man who brought Christianity to Ireland? I wonder what he would think about all the goings on today. And don't we think about that with a lot of people? I mean, people who have their names on things, you think, oh my goodness. March 17th, as you can imagine, um, is a day, day near and dear to my heart because the Nolans, the Paddens, the Burks, and the Monahans are in the family tree. And being an Irish woman, I should start my talk with a joke. But those I hear, I never remember. I can't tell jokes. You wouldn't want to hear it. Unlike my Uncle Jack Brennan, he was a Bedouin millman hard drinking, hard working. I think he and his crew helped to make Undo's the success it is today. I'm not kidding. From the mill, two Undo's, three hours, Boilermakers, how they got home, who knows. He played in the Elks Minstrel for many years as an end man. He seemed to know every Pat and Mike joke there was. A true gift I do not have. So you see me standing before you, somewhat of a throwback to my Irish heritage, because I don't like liquor either, and I hate cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> so today we will be talking about the Gaelic Irish, as opposed to the Scots Irish, which were basically Northern Ireland Irish Protestants with a Scottish background. They were one of the earliest groups to settle Western Virginia, as I'm sure a lot of you know this history, along with the English and the Welsh. But that fascinating history is left to another time, and that would be a good talk if we haven't had it. 
I would point out that the In Wheeling magazine issue on ethnic wheeling is an invaluable resource for research. Um, this is a real keeper, and I'm sure it's in the wheeling room, but I consulted it and found things I would forgotten was in there, and it has all the ethnic groups of wheeling. If you ever want to know about ethnic wheeling, this is one of the places to go. It has a chart on the ethnic genes of our city giving the breakdown from the 2000 census. Now we know the Germans are the big group. 27% of, of uh, Wheeling are Germans, but the Irish are next, 17%. The English, still 11%. The Italians, the newer immigrants, 6.8%. The Polish, next, 6.1%. And then we go Scots, Irish, and then the Slavic people, etc. But I think that's really kind of neat to know. Now, how and why did the Irish come to Wheeling? Well, here's a little history. Ireland had been under the complete control of the English since the 1600s. And the system that was imposed there with the Irish working almost as serfs on little land in their own country, while most of the wealth was in the hands of the English gentry. Now, this has progressed over a long uh, number of years. Thus, in the 1800s, Ireland was like a third world country. So when the opportunity to leave presented itself, often it was taken. Thus the builders of the national road, the canals and the railroads in this country and in this state often, recruited the Irish for their workforce, often sending delegates even to Ireland. So thousands came even before the famine. That's why some of our, our, our Irish uh, families here may even go like back to the 1820s and 30s. <coughs> um, if you go out to Seven Dollars Church off National Road in Tridelphia, you will find a precious graveyard with some very old tombstones. One tells us a young man died in 1819 age 26, from County Tyrone. Another names John Doyle from County Down, who died in June of 1819, age 46. Many stones are illegible. You wonder, who were these men? Probably workers building the National Road to Wheeling in 1818, dying so far from home. The importance of the National Road, this national main street from Cumberland to the Ohio River, cannot be overemphasized. It connected the east and west in our country, and here we were, sitting at the end. But building this road was backbreaking work, clearing the land, crushing the stone, crossing the mountains, and basically the Irish did it. For about $6 a month, moving their camps slowly across the Alleghenies and making it possible for other immigrants to come and end up in Wheeling. By 1823, there were enough Germans and Irish Catholics in the area to build St. James Church at Wheeling, where the present YWCA stands. That was the first church in Wheeling. A priest from St. Patrick's Church in Pittsburgh, an Irish guy, of course, an Irish church, uh, came to minister. With the National Road connecting to the Ohio River, as you can imagine, industry boomed and jobs expanded. Wheeling became the largest, most industrialized town in western Virginia. Meanwhile, back in Ireland, things were getting worse. And I learned this, Frederick Douglass actually visited Ireland in 1845, just as the famine was starting, to rally support against slavery. But what he saw shocked him. Never did human faces tell a sadder tale. The people lacked only black skin to complete their likeness of the plantation Negro, my own cruelly abused people. I thought that was really interesting. I'd never heard that before. We have, do we have our priest coming in? Father Red, come on in. Henry, uh, accident. Oh, really? Yeah. 
Population, and there's a whole story of why that was true. And I didn't realize this the blight came first from America on a ship into Belgium, and then it fanned out, and it was airborne and it was deadly. It caused the potatoes to rot black in the fields. The blight continued for basically five years. The dates, people say 1845 to 1850, but some give 52, but it went on after 1850. This caused the Angorta Moor, the Great Hunger. Those three words, Great Hunger. Terrific. This was one of the worst human calamities in history, and it's really a story unto itself. So maybe next year, Sean could get somebody to give a talk <laughs> on the Irish famine. Now, I know we're way beyond this, but when I read this stuff again, if I had an Englishman in front of me, I would have not been good. <laughs> this tragic event over 150 years ago is why many of us are in this room today. 150 years ago decisions were made and here we are right today. And why there are so many Irish in Wheeling. Ireland in 1841 had over 8 million people. It was one of the world's densest populated spaces. By 1871, she had around 4 million. It was halved in 30 years. Now, some in England said publicly it was good to thin out the Irish. <laughs> True, some of the political leaders, let's clear the land, then it could be used for bigger farms, and so let's bring in some cows. In the worst year, 1847, there were about 250,000 deaths. The people began leaving in droves and the dying by starvation um, uh, while being a part of the richest empire in the world at that time. It was pretty bad. Some of the landlords did pay the way for their tenants uh, to get on the ships because remember you're thinking, how could they even afford the passage? Well, some of the landlords wanted to clear the land so they shipped them out. It took about four pounds sterling one way, and it took about four to seven weeks, depending on where you landed, and that's a whole issue of talking about the voyage over. The cheapest fare was to Canada or the southern U.S. That's why there's an Irish quarter in New Orleans, and Savannah, Georgia has one of the biggest St. Patrick's Day parades in this country. Many of these people were weak and sick, and quite a few died on the journey. They were poor, they were uneducated immigrants, but worst of all for this country, they were Catholic. I'm sure you can imagine the fear and bewilderment of the then American population to be invaded in such a short time by a virtual swarm of Catholics and in the port cities of Boston, Philadelphia, and New York. The irony is these largely rural people would end up in the urban centers. Of course, the Catholic Church was a major support system for the transplanted Irish. It was something they could hang on to, something that looked after their needs, fed, clothed them. And the Irish gave back to the church by filling the ranks of its priests, its sisters, and its brothers. In fact, the Irish kind of took over the church. By 1900, three-fourths of the country's cardinals and more than half of the U.S. bishops were of Irish descent. So much so, the Germans and Italians began to revolt and complain. I didn't realize that until you see that in print, you think, wow. As you can imagine, because the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad was almost to Wheeling, arriving in 1852, and because of the natural network regarding jobs, many Irish found their way here, and they came face to face with anti-Catholic bigotry. Wheeling was a microcosm of American history, of course. What was out there was here. There's a great story that illustrates this problem. It happened only several blocks 
up the street. When the Irish Catholics came pouring into the U.S., the political party was formed called the Native American Party, or the Know Nothings. It came to be in 1845, right at the beginning of the famine. Its platform was hate and intolerance, America for Americans, and anybody else stay away. They were active here in Wheeling. In 1853, the Pope decided to send a special envoy, Archbishop Bedini, to check out the status of the church in this country, perhaps set up a diplomatic relations with the Vatican. Bad timing, very bad timing. Now, the Bishop of Wheeling uh, <clears throat> then was Richard Vincent Whelan, an Irishman from Baltimore. So he invited the envoy to drop down from Pittsburgh and visit here. Well, the anti-Catholic group found out they decided to disrupt the visit. The bishop asked the mayor, I think he was Mr. Sweeney, for help. He declined. So Whelan called out the men of the cathedral parish to provide security. About 200 armed Irish, and I'm sure a few Germans, raided the cathedral block as the mob approached. The bishop confronted them. Bishop Whelan was kind of tough. He came out, talked to them. <laughs> he sent the envoy out the back door. A rock was thrown through the window, and the crowd dispersed. Now, one of the men defending the cathedral, which probably could have been burned, because churches and convents were burned in other cities in the country. It was a nasty time. One of the men was Thomas O'Brien, head of the O'Brien family here. When I go up 13th Street sometimes, I think of that. If you can, and there's a picture here you might want to look at. They, the Hibernians did a rendition of that same thing happened at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. This happened all over the country. Uh, and so the Irish, now this would have been the Hibernians in New York, because they were organized then. They ringed the cathedral with their clubs and their guns, and they didn't get to the church. Um, so many Irish priests and sisters have served the people of this city and this state. Bishop Donahue, of course, led the church from 1894 to 1922, before Bishop Swint. And such good priests have ministered here with names like Father Lee, Brady, Mullen, O'Connell, O'Doherty, McCurran, O'Reilly, the typical Irish names. And of course, today, Father Jeremiah McSweeney, he's sitting over here. He's head of the largest parish in West Virginia, St. Mike's. And Father Larry Wren, who's sitting up here. He's retired at the Wealthy Apartments. He's serving in this diocese for 37 years and he is from Ireland as his father McSweeney. Of course, you have only to listen to them, and you know that. <laughs> now, we must mention the Visitation Sisters, here from 1848 to 2010, with so many Irish women there. But the largest group in the state has always been the Sisters of St. Joseph, who arrived here in April of 1853. You know, all this was happening at once. You had the famine through the 40s. You had the Visitation in 48 and you had the sisters in 53. I'm sure this city was really not thrilled with all this. Over 600 women have joined that order. I didn't realize that. I was asking their archivist. Including a very special person we have with us today, Sister Myraid Scanlon. She's 90 years young. She's from County Limerick. She came over from Ireland in 1946 68 years ago with 11 others to minister to the people of West Virginia. These women have taught in our schools, some were principals, one was an administrator at Wheeling Hospital, one headed the Wheeling Hospital School of Nursing and then went on to help establish the West Liberty Nursing Program. So many dedicated women. So Sister Myray will say a few words to us, by the way that's Gailey for Margaret, uh, she will offer a prayer for reflection. Sister Marley. I chose uh, just a fraction of St. Patrick's breastplate. It has seven, seven long verses in it. So these are the ones, the little one I chose. I arise today through a mighty strength 
the invocation of the Trinity through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. Christ, when I lie down, Christ, when I sit down, Christ, when I rise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks to me, Christ in the eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. Amen. I didn't realize how long that was, even then, St. Patrick, I mean, the Irish are so gregarious and wordy, I guess, <laughs> whatever. Uh, you may, some of you may know Sister, she worked for many years as a chaplain at Wheeling Hospital, and she now volunteers there, so she's still around. So, now moving along, the Civil War was an important time for the Irish in the United States and in Wheeling. Governor Pierpont was conscious of their backing of the Union cause. The Germans and the Irish immigrants, they backed the Union big time. In 1863, he urged them in the newspaper to support the new state. I wish I could speak to the heart of every Irishman and German here. I would try to help them see what their interests are and their duty is as patriots. I had not seen that before. I thought that was interesting. Uh, the work of the sisters at Wheeling Hospital during this time was important. Headed by an Irishman, she was off the boat, Sister DeChantel Keating, brought in from New York to help our small group here. But the work at Wheeling Hospital got the attention of the community, and the Irish fought for the Union in droves. Although, and this is a story that's very interesting, I don't know a whole lot about, but the Southern Irish fought for the Confederacy the ones in New Orleans and Georgia, and in one particular battle at Fredericksburg, Virginia, the Southern Irish mowed down the Northern Irish on the battlefield. Terrific story. And Pat Duffy, who's with us here, so active at, in the Alps as chair of the Committee on Americanism and the Veterans Committee, will speak of the patriotism of these early Irish. Thank you, Peg, for the uh, kind of introduction. Uh, I always feel it's just not an honor. It's a privilege sometimes to be on the same uh, program with, uh, with Peg Brennan. And today, you know, we talk about all the great Irish who were born or who migrated to our great city and settled here in Wheeling, and you'll find none better or none more Irish than Peg Brennan. And we are very truly blessed, Peg, to have you with us and in our area. And I know Peg told me, and she didn't tell me, she actually warned me that I only have five minutes. <laughs> so, so we don't want to prolong it any more than that. You know, as we look back over the history of our great city and valley, we can be very proud of the contributions made by our Irish families and uh, our, our Irish clan. The Irish were not very well liked by other ethnic groups as they came to the United States, as Peg had mentioned. And uh, short of maybe like the black skin, they were very heavily discriminated against uh, when they came over here. Uh, especially when it came to jobs. Uh, they, just, they just wouldn't want no part of the uh, the, the Irish people here. In fact, they even put signs up, you know, Irish do not even apply. <coughs> That's, you know, when it came to, to the jobs. And they really suffered their share of the poverty. But the Irish, you know, the Irish were put down because they said they had no skill uh, tendencies when they came over here, or they weren't very intelligent. Uh, they were just really ridiculed. But the Irish, we know, were fairly intelligent. They were fairly intelligent people. And, and I think one of the first signs was back years ago, and we know 
We know that the Germans invented the toilet seat. We all know that. But we also know if the Irish perfected it, they cut the hole in it. <laughs> so the Irish were fairly intelligent people, you know, I had that for that. And you can always tell, you can always tell when the Irish were having a great celebration in the valley or anywhere. Because when you pick the paper up the next morning, the headline says, Among the Injured. <laughs> and they are very sympathetic people also, very sympathetic and very kind. Remember the story of, again, of Mikey and Pat. They were out fishing one bright sunny spring morning under the bridge. And as they were fishing for over an hour or so, they looked up and Mikey seen a funeral procession coming down of the bridge. So he lays his pole down and he stands up, puts his hand over his heart for about five, ten minutes until the funeral passed. And Patty says, Michael, I didn't know, I didn't know you were so uh, religious. And he says, well, you know, he said, that's the least that I could do. He said, we already been married for 42 years. <laughs> But we know, we know many, many of the great programs that the Irish worked on and did while, you know, coming up to this country. And we know one of the greatest opportunities for the Irish was the role that the Irish played in the role of the Civil War. And the role of the Civil War was played uh, in West Virginia becoming the 35th state in our nation. The Civil War provided the Irish in America with a superb, if grim, opportunity to, dis to disprove the nativists' claim that they would never make loyal American citizens. But we know more than 144,000 Irish born served in the Union Army. In addition, tens of thousands of American born Irish also served. And thousands and thousands ended up giving their life to, uh, for the Union. And we have to remember, it, approximately 89 Irish-born soldiers would earn the Congressional Medal of Honor. So it says a lot about, about the Irish, despite what a lot of the other groups would say about them. And one of the reasons so many Irish served in the Civil War was because of the poverty. Many Irish immigrants stepped off ships in America and were immediately confronted by the Union Army recruiters and they offered them two or three hundred dollars cash bonuses for their enlistments. Because they were penniless, immigrants with no specialized skills thought this offer equal to a year's pay at the beginning of the war was too good to refuse. So we can go on and on. There have been many, many stories uh, in regards to the Civil War that the great American people have, have played. And if we had the time today, which, which uh, Peg asked me to be a little bit brief, uh, we could go on for hours or days talking about the great accomplishments that the Irish had played. Just not the Civil War, in all the wars, or in, in, in the building of our great country today. So without taking much more of your time, because I know we have other people here who would like to speak, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank Sean uh, for this talk today, but for a great job that Sean has done here the past several years. You know, he, he has published a couple books and he's brought back a lot of memories to a lot of our people, a lot of our families here, here in Wheeling. And also, while we're here today, I think we'd like to wish Sean a happy birthday. <laughs> And to Peg Brennan, once again, Peg, thank you for putting this on today, and uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to come down and share with you. And remember, we thank you, and God bless you, and God bless the United States of America.
That was perfect. And, and of course, he can embarrass his own son, because of course that's Sean's father, as you all know. And his mother's here, too. And, uh, Sean, uh, when, when is your birthday? Sunday. Passed. Sunday? It passed. Okay. Very good. All right. Uh, congratulations. Um, we know that uh, some Wheeling Irish fought in the Civil War. Um, and this is an area that needs more research. I know one name, and that, of course, is Thomas O'Brien. We have a picture of him in uniform. And he served with General Kelly at Philippi, and he became a lifelong friend of Kelly. But I know there are others out there who just don't, aren't aware of them. Now, when the Irish arrived in Wheeling, they settled um, together, usually, as did so many other ethnic groups, um, feeling more secure with their own nationality. They were poor coming in, and generally the poor in the city um, live on the outskirts or are pushed to the hills, uh, think the black population of Wheeling. Thus, we will find Irish families in North Wheeling, O'Leary, or Warwood, War O'Leary's, they got around, <laughs> where there was a court town. Some settled near the center of church power, the cathedral. In later years, the O'Briens and the Rileys, early lace curtain Irish who had made good, had homes on 13th Street, right near the bishop's house. And before them, Michael Riley, with two L's, lived right around the corner where the Scottish Rite Temple is today. That was Riley property. Many immigrant Irish settled in South Wheeling, an old neighborhood, old Ritchie town with a lot of job potential. In potteries, glass, nails, a brewery, that was good, <laughs> uh, tobacco, and continental can, later on, among others. The church, St. Mary's, or the Immaculate Conception, dedicated in 1873, and incidentally, it was one of the last things Bishop Whalen died, he died around 1874, was a center of life for the Irish, and usually had an Irish priest. There was a sort of Irish hill behind La Belle Nail Works, where my mother was born. I'm thinking the noise would have been terrific to live there. And John Monaghan speaks of an Irish ghetto around 47th and 48th Street, and that's something that needs more research. So many Irish families sunk roots in South Wheeling. The Fathays from County Galway came to New York in 1853 and some migrated to Lewis County near Weston. If you've ever done a lot of driving around there, it does remind you of the Green Hills of Ireland. Uh, there was available land, and it was offered to them. Eventually, three boys came to Wheeling, and this family has made a great impact on the area, including, um, we have Jack Fahey here with us. He's a one-man political um, world service. He had former mayor, county commissioner, I think you were in the state legislature? Two and years. Two years in the state legislature, okay. And then we have the present vice mayor, who's his son. I talk about a little nepotism here, but maybe. <laughs> Earned it on his own, good man. And of course, we also have a McCormick as county commissioner. And if you weren't that, hey, you're a McCormick. So, you know. Um, and of course, there was the Owens family. They came to West Virginia during the potato famine. They ended up in South Wheeling, where son Michael worked at Hobbs Pecunia, learning the glass trade. His picture is over here, to the left. He rose to invent the famous bottle machine. He lent his name to Owens, Illinois, Libby Owens Ford, and Owens Corning. And if you had stock in his company, a lot of willing people did, you made a bundle of money. His inventions effectively eliminated child labor from the glass industry, which I think is just so important. His family, his mother, his dad, his sisters, are buried at Mount Calvary, the mausoleum. And that's where the uh, original entrance to Mount Calvary went, right in in front of the Owens mausoleum. And he was a great man. He's one of the greatest uh, in the glass industry in the country, and he came from Wheeling. Um, I, will, 
I think we have time to say a little bit about um, my own um, family, uh, also from South Wheeling. Really. Um, my great grandfather, he's over here, John Monahan. He looks kind of like a leprechaun, <laughs> uh, but he was a tough man and he lived to be 80. In those days, he died around 1921. That was a long life. He came over as a young man, I'm assuming a pre famine, um, to find work, and he did on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Their recruiter, as Pat said, would hire the Irish right off the boats for work and also, you know, for the war. Great grandfather was from County Mayo, one of the poorest counties in all of Ireland. And he was one of the thousands that left his home. And I can't imagine, I just can't put myself in that place. Going on a ship for five, six weeks, wow. Um, in our family, when we spoke of County Mayo, we always said, County Mayo, God help us. The way you said it, County Mayo, God help us. I just ran into another lady recently, and she had that same thing. I'd never heard it before. John Monahan helped to construct the railroad tracks over the mountains. And on that fateful day, Christmas Eve, December 24, 1852, this 20-year-old man was there when they drove the Golden Spike connecting the line. They built out from Wheeling and then from Baltimore. Uh, one of the neatest experiences of my life was go, to go out to Rosebees Rock, 150 years to the day, and it was pouring rain. Uh, 2002, a rainy evening, and we stood in the silence and tried to hear the voices and to feel the spirit of these men. Great-grandfather did not stay here long, though, because he heard that his bow back in Ireland was stepping out. <laughs> so he went back immediately, but probably with a bundle of cash or money, and he married his sweetheart, Anna Burke. Yet he never forgot Wheeling. In 1884, the family packed their trunks. There was another blight. Uh, there were blights throughout the years in the potatoes, some lesser, the great famine, but then there were other ones in the 60s and the 80s. And they came to Castle Garden, that was before Ellis Island, in New York. And then they came over the very railroad that John had built to Wheeling. And he settled in South Wheeling. He worked as a crossing guard at the B&O at 36th Street. And my mother remembered walking with him to visit friends up on Irish Hill. And when they didn't want her to know what they were saying, they would speak in Gaelic. Um, mother said uh, that she remembered, and she taught me when I was little, and I think this happens in all ethnic groups. You learn the swear words. <laughs> and that's the first game I ever know, knew, and I still know it, and I'm not going to say it because it's not very nice. <laughs> but that is true as a child. Um, and I have his cane. I know. Here's his cane that's in the picture. <laughs> Very old. Okay. Now, um, let me go back to where I was. There are two names well known in Wheeling today of the Irish, of course, to make sure I didn't forget anything. I'm switching in and out here depending on the time. Okay. Um, I want to mention the Irish gangs. I only found a couple references to them. I'm sure it wasn't as bad as New York, and then you join gang gangs to have a place to belong, you know. Maybe beat up on some people that are trying to beat up on you. Um, the Fighting Irish were one gang, that's interesting. And the Holy, the Howley Town Gang, and I believe they were from South Wheeling. There are many Irish families in Wheeling that, uh, to name names, gets dicey, but I will, anyway. Uh, one of the first Irish families to make good in Wheeling was the Riley clan, as we said, spelled Riley with two L's. Uh, Philip Riley came over in 1821 from County Cavan. He started a wholesale grocery business, which became very prosperous. His son, Michael, helped form the company that built the suspension bridge. And this is important because you see his name in a lot of stuff in Wheeling history, and he's not the only Gaelic Irish name you see. It was hard to be accepted. The family had a block in Wheeling named for them and a big building. There's a picture here, or there, I'm not sure if it's like. Unfortunately, 
Michael made the traitor's list during the Civil War and took the wrong side. There are descendants still in the area, including the head of the Moundsville Public Library. She's a Riley, and she's directly descended from him. Okay. There are two names well known in Wheeling today, the O'Briens and the other Rileys. They have statewide significance. Both families came from County Cavan. 19-year-old Thomas O'Brien arrived in 1851, and it is said he walked from Cumberland to Wheeling over the National Road. A lot seem to do that. I don't know if it's a family story. I got that from the O'Briens, and then Arch Riley said his guy did too. I thought, okay, a lot of Irish were out there walking. <laughs> um, he worked for the B&O, fought in the Civil War. He became surveyor of the Port of Wheeling, thus his portrait hangs in West Virginia Independence Hall. Then he served on the governor's staff for six years. In 1880, he was elected state treasurer, probably the first Gaelic Irishman to hold such a high position. That's why he's so important. His family, of course, went into law. We know Frank and the gang, and Tim and Molly O'Brien carried the name to the business or to the music world. In 1828, Olin Riley came to Boston, then Baltimore, then Wheeling, again walking the National Road with a shillelagh under his arm. That says Arch Riley, that was what he told me before he deceased. One of his sons, Thomas, read law, became one of the finest lawyers in the state and a leader in the Democratic Party. In 1892, Thomas was elected Attorney General of West Virginia. And in 1922, he built the Riley Law Building, now being beautifully renovated by the Crawford's Company. But I'll always think of it as the Riley Law Building. His sons, of course, were all lawyers. And then there's the Duffy family. They immigrated from County Roscommon in 1843, so just before the famine. Descendant Joseph and Nell Duffy had 10 children, greatly enriching uh, Wheeling's life, and there's some information on these families and these boards here. Now the O'Learys, they came from County Cork in 1874. They settled in North Wheeling and South Warwood. Harold O'Leary, how to many, is Wheeling's Dean of Theater, we all know him. I could go on and on with a resume, but I won't. We are honored to have him here today to share the poetry of Willie Butler, William Butler Yates, Mr. O'Leary. Thank you, Mr. Ah, oh, it's great to be here, really. And I'm I have to say that I am proud to be Irish, as almost all Irish people are, and would justifiably so. Um, as Greg said, we're going to do a poem by William Butler Yeats. And the name of the poem is The Song of the Wandering Angus. And it has probably more interpretations and critiques than any poem Gates uh, wrote. And it's a little difficult, I think, to hear it the first time and expect to make something of it. And so I'd like to say a couple of words about the poem itself. It's about a man who has a dream of finding the girl of his, the love of his life, and uh, goes on a quest an eternal quest to find this dream. Uh, everybody who reads it comes up with a little different interpretation. And I'm one of those people. And I have a son, Sean, who is a playwright, a successful playwright. And in his first play about the Spanish Civil War, the play ends with a quote. And this is my favorite quote, by the way. And he's admonishing the Franco regime, of course, and saying that although the loyalists lost, they should be remembered, and there will come a time when perhaps what they fought for and gave their lives for can be realized. But the the connection between 
the quote that I'm about to give you and Yeats' poem. Sean wrote at the end of the play, I don't know if there is a utopia, but I'm certain that we must act as though there can be. And I connect it to the poem by saying, I don't know that there is the idyllic love that we seek, but we must never quit seeking it. And this is what I think William Butler Yeats had in mind in the song of the wandering Angus. I went out to the hazel wood because a fire was in my head. I cut and peeled a hazel wand and hooked a berry to a thread. And when white moths were on the wing and moth-like stars were flickering out, I dropped a berry in a stream and caught a little silver trout. When I had laid it on the floor, I went to blow the fire aflame. But something rustled on the floor. And someone called me by my name. She had become a glimmering girl with apple blossoms in her hair who called me by my name and ran and faded in the brightening air. Though I am old with wandering through hollow land and hilly land, I will find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hand and walk among long dappled grass and pluck till time and times have done the silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun. Thank you. Now, what about the Irish presence in Wheeling today? Well, it's seen by the wonderful Celtic Fest that we just had, um, and by the Celtic Cross at Heritage, for probably the largest Celtic Cross in the state, I would hope. If we're going to have one, we want it to be the best. <laughs> and plus, we have the tremendous fall road bowling tournament, one of the largest in this country. I think Craig O'Leary is very instrumental. I won't ask if there are any road bowling champions in the uh, room. I wouldn't want to embarrass anybody. Uh, but, uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of um, conveniality and, and some beer flowing at that time. Um, and this uh, year, last year, we had two visits from the Irish um, Deputy Consul in New York, uh, Peter Ryan. And uh, we're not quite sure why he came to Wheeling, but we're thrilled that he did. And he even came back sooner than we thought. But he's out there, and he's responsible for West Virginia, and he wanted to meet the people. He's, he's a great man. Um, and he loves West Virginia. And we're hoping he'll come back for a bowling, road bowling tournament. Of course, what's not to love, but... Um, the Ancient Order of Hibernians uh, first organized in Wheeling in 1873, and there were hundreds and hundreds. And I know Sean is doing so much research, and when you go through the papers, and you, you always hit every year St. Patrick's Day, and that's when you find out what the Irish are doing. And the Hibernians, at one point, they had a dance, they had 700 people there. It was at the Market Auditorium, and I was thinking, that's a lot of bodies. Um, it became a huge focal point of Irish life. It lost steam and kind of closed down during World War II. But then, Jack Fahey resurrected it in 2006. And um, you may have seen them this weekend. They were in the Pittsburgh Parade. Was it wonderful? Good. And uh, I'm sure they had a grand time. They march. How many shot march? 20 or 25 from Wheeling. I'm sure you had a banner. A banner. Yeah. So they knew we were here. This is good. <laughs> uh, Sean Duffy is researching the history of the Hibernian, and he's written a great article. <coughs> if you don't have this, every Irishman should. 
It's uh, the historical review. It's great cover, and um, it talks about the um, history of the Hibernians pictures. And we have a few to be purchased today, if you would like to. The editor of this is Becca Corella. She's over here, and she brought a bunch. I think they're three dollars. Uh, Five dollars. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Sean, you pay five dollars. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so that's a look at the Irish and Wheeling. There are more stories to collect, more work to be done. Sarah Fitzsimmons of Warwood, 94, she says, tell them to do their family history. She called me yesterday and she'd say, I've got another idea. I think she calls the radio station that her nephew owns too, from what I've heard about. But she said, collect the stories before the people are gone. And, and I think when you think, what is history? His story. Her story. History, the history of the Irish and Wheeling is in this room. It really is in the stories. And, and a lot of it is written down. So we owe it to our descendants and to our city to collect the stories, to write them down, to put them on the computer, put them on disks, whatever it takes. And so that people will know and will remember. Um, there are some displays here. And Pittsburgh did a book recently, which I bought, of course. Uh, these are Acadia books. You see them whenever you turn around. They're the Irish of Pittsburgh. And I thought, I read the whole thing. Well, I looked at the pictures and mostly read it. <laughs> it's mostly pictures. But I thought, we could do that. I'd probably do it, say this a little better, but, but there's so many from Pittsburgh. So anyway, that might be something to think about. The Irish of Wheeling. Why not? We could do that. If anybody wants to look at that, they can. Now to close out, uh, in, in older days, um, there was a lot of Gaelic um, spoken on Wheeling streets. Although, I must say, once the Irish came to this country, they didn't go back. That's only a more recent phenomenon. The Polish, or not the Polish, but the Italians, they would go back a lot. They went back and forth all over the place. And I remember my mother telling me the story. She asked her mother, would you like to go back in later years? And my grandmother said, no. Don't even want to think about it. There were so many sad memories that a lot of the Irish just couldn't. They didn't. They wouldn't. Well, we're so grateful to have the born Irish and the Irish descendants here in Wheeling. And Father Wren uh, will close it out, sharing some Gaelic. He is a Gaelic speaker and a Gaelic teacher. And he will share some Gaelic with us. Father Wren.
there was an Irish priest here in Queenly, and he was given a mission. And uh, he said, all those who want to go to heaven, please stand. Anybody here who wants to go to heaven, please stand. Do you want to go to heaven? Stand. You said you know. Do you want to go to heaven? But anyway, everybody in the church stood up. And then he said, how many people here want to go to hell? Stand up. And there was one man right in front. And he was a kind of a jester. And he said, Father, I don't like you to go to hell all by yourself. <laughs> parked his car on a double yellow line in Dublin. And a police officer came up and he says, that's illegal, you can't do that. Anyway, he went to the court and the judge said, why did you park your car on a double yellow line? And he said, I saw a sign, fine for parking. <laughs> We can misinterpret things. <laughs> An Irish lesson. May you always have walls for the winds, a roof for the rain, tea beside the fire, laughter to cheer you, those you love near you, and all your heart might desire. And now I'm going to finish with an Irish prayer, the old form. Ar nacher at hal ar nacher, benetur tenet, gudagal do bilt, benetur da chol ar an dalaf, mada netur ar nacher. An ar an le hul, tu a doing anu, agus mat doing ar bilka, mada bachar bid na da mel hu na fe, agus na lekshin ag hu, ag searchin, of men. And we finish uh, with the glory be to the Father, a great prayer that we have inherited down through the centuries. And we all say together, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. August Gamanimi Bio and a Nong Shop Arish. It's an Irish lesson. For many of you that we may be alive to enjoy the same again. Uh, pretty much we're on schedule. I, I don't know if you want questions. I know some people may have to leave. Do you want to take like two questions? We'll be around. If you would like to see Sister Myrie or Father McSweeney or Father the History of Ireland, if you want to ask some questions. Does anybody have an urgent question you want to say? Good. Okay. <laughs>
Father's Days at noon. Bring your lunch, we'll provide the pop. And it's all free. Lunch with